afternoon, we have uh, Dr. Joey Singh, uh, Joel Singh, sorry, um, who, uh, who's uh, part of the Libra SSL project. Uh, as many of you, I'm sure, know, is a fork of the Open SSL project. And he, this afternoon, is here to tell you just what happened. Thank you. As introduced, my name's Joel. Um, I'm one of the founders of the Libra SSL project. I also work as a SRE with Canonical, and I need to thank them for enabling me to be here this week. Before I dive in, how many of you have written an application which has made use of TLS either as a client or as a server? Quite a few of you. How many of you have used OpenSSL to do that? How many of you have used TLS? Trick question. Hopefully everyone did when they registered for Linux Conf AU. <laughs> so I want to take you on a little bit of a journey. Um, it's going to be a dual talk. I'm going to give you a bit of a background about libtls, the TLS API that we've created. It's sort of a TLS talk wrapped in the guise of an API design talk, or it's an API design talk wrapped around a talk about libtls, depending on which way you want to look at it. But the bottom line is we wanted to look at ways to make it easier and safer to write applications that actually make use of TLS. What is libtls? It's a new TLS library. It has a hopefully clean, obvious, and simple API. And this was what we set out to achieve. And I, yeah, I'd like to think we're at least part of the way there. It was designed so that people could write applications which are foolproof, or at least closer to foolproof than you might with other tool sets. And it happens to be the fourth component of LibreSSL. LibreSSL has four components, as I mentioned. First one of which is the OpenSSL command line utility, which is, yeah, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. We also have libcrypto, which is effectively the crypto library that sh ships with OpenSSL, LibSSL, and libtls. But before I get to libtls itself, I want to take you on a little bit of a journey and cover a little bit of the history as to how we actually got where we are. As most of you or some of you might remember, April 2014, we had this small security incident called Heartbleed. Now, one of the OpenBSD developers who I work with um, started looking at ways that he could uh, effectively alleviate the problems which were being attacked via Heartbleed, and he started looking at exploit countermeasures. However, in doing so, he fell down a rabbit hole. This was actually a rather interesting experience. OpenBSD, the Malik implementation that ships with it, has a number of exploit countermeasures, some of which enable by default, others which you have to actually go out of your way to turn on, mostly because they, you, know, you take a performance hit for using them. The ones that were of particular interest here are a thing called guard pages. So basically, if you read or write over the end of the memory which has been allocated to you, things explode. And that's obviously better than giving away secret keys. The other one which he was looking at turning on, which isn't on by default, is junking or poisoning. So basically, when you actually allocate in free memory, we actually scribble over it so that the contents that were in it aren't actually available to you. Had this actually worked, we probably wouldn't have LibreSSL. We probably wouldn't be standing here today. Heartbleed of itself wasn't actually enough of an incentive to really create a fork and you know, go through the process and challenges, shall I say, that we've been through over the last couple of years. What turned out to be happening is that OpenSSL implemented a thing called free lists. They had decided that on certain platforms, the cost of malloc and free was too high, and therefore they would effectively save you from this and do it themselves. This was implemented as a LIFO, last in, first out. This is an option which is on by default. So even if you have a decent operating system, Malik, which is performant, doesn't matter, we, you still get free lists. It's a compile time option. So if you want to turn this thing off, you had to actually go and recompile your libraries. So this meant that, OK, well, we can't actually ex uh, mitigate heart lead via these particular countermeasures. Because when we actually did a free inside OpenSSL or LibSSL, it was actually keeping the memory. 
So this also meant that things like valgrind, Caverity, various analysis tools, which would normally have picked up these sorts of bugs, were going, oh no, they haven't freed the memory, it's not a problem. So he went and turned it off. Nginx started crashing, scratching his head. A little bit later, he realized that there's another bug going on here. There's a thing called SSL mode release buffers. Basically, what this does is when you have finished with a buffer, supposedly, it's supposed to return it automatically and you know, will basically allocate one when you, again when you do the next read. However, this happened to be buggy. It basically meant that whenever you return something, um, or it basically hadn't actually finished with the buffer, but it didn't matter because when it returned it and when you asked for it again, you usually got the same thing back again. So it worked. This didn't work so well and often causes nasty issues when you actually use it with threading because you may actually get someone else's memory rather than the memory that you actually freed and obviously malloced again. So after figuring out what was going on and fixing this, it was a case of, oh, okay, well, we can finally turn off the LIFO free lists. We can uh, use software which actually makes use of SSL mode release buffers and we're all good. Again, at this point, we're probably not necessarily going to create a fork. However, the bug which happens to be linked there turns out to have been reported four years earlier and is sitting in the RT. So it was sort of a whole bunch of stuff which, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back, we finally gone, okay, we actually probably need to do something here. And so we forked OpenSSL and LibreSSL as we know it began. Fast forward a few months, July 2014, uh, there's a bunch of us working at an OpenBSD developers conference and most of what we were doing was working on stripping code out, um, making things sensible, at least trying to head in that direction. And when I was conversing with Ted in the process, we sort of went, hey, we really should think about doing a better API. Okay, you got an itch, let's scratch it. Later that week, I came back to Ted and said, well, here's a rough implementation, what do you think? And he went, mm, yeah, I like that bit, don't like that bit, yeah, let's move with it. Uh, it was originally known as re-SSL, because hence the title of the talk, we were rethinking the way that SSL's implemented, or at least the API. But it later got renamed to libtls when it became more obvious that you know, re-SSL wasn't a great name for it. Uh, libssl, libssl, there's a little bit of confusion going on there. Under the hood, we currently use libssl. So if you use libtls, you're still using libssl, things are still using libcrypto. Most of it is, is still, for a lot of intents and purposes, the same underneath, but your interface, what you're dealing with isn't. So the general goals for the libssl project are to modernize the code base, improve security, and apply best practice development processes. That's one half of the project. The other half of the project is to introduce a new API which completely rethinks how you do things. But TLS is complex and messy. If you've ever played with this stuff, uh, you'll know there's various levels of handshake processes involved. Each of these have various variety of handshake messages, have various fun parts to them. There's a record layer which provides you with the underlying encryption um, and, and basically encapsulation and decapsulation. We have things like SSL v2, v3, TLS v1.0, 1.1, 1.2, and soon TLS 1.3. And then we also have to remember to deal with really fun things like, do we actually want to talk to clients that might have SSL v2 enabled but can still do, say, TLS 1.2? Because if they do, they can't send an SSL v3 record to you. They have to send you an SSL v2 record, which is basically saying inside it that yes, I can do better than SSL v2, but if you don't accept that, you effectively won't talk to them. Um, maybe that's a good thing, maybe it's not. Depends on what you're running. We have a whole range of TLS extensions, things like SNI, ALPN, which I'll come back to later on in the talk. Um, we have a variety of crypto, public key, symmetric key exchange, loads of gotchas hiding under here. There's things such as PKIX 509, and just to top it all off, a good mixture of ASN1. Tip it all in, shake it, not stirred. But it should be easy to use. You shouldn't have to understand all of TLS just to be able to get to the point where you can write an application which actually uses it. Who here drives a car? Do you understand how your car works? Can you fix it? Can you change the tyres? Can you... Yeah, some of you can. I would expect that here. 
Not all of you need to know how your car works to the point where you can service and maintain the thing yourself just so you can use it. TLS, yeah, I see is the same. So, okay, you know, if we're going to reinvent the wheel, we probably need to make sure it's a better wheel. Why not use existing APIs? And this is the part of the talk which, you know, is a little bit challenging. I'm trying not to give you large code dumps, but you know, we need a little bit to point out and talk about. <laughs> So at this point, we're going to assume that we've already done all the work necessary to resolve DNS, and we've got an established socket. That's done. We're then going to create an SSL context. We run some code to do that. We create an SSL session. We now set the file descriptor, and we do a connect, we do a write, we do a read, and we shut down. All good so far. What just happened? What version of TLS did we just connect with? Who here knows, or if you don't, wants to have a guess at what the SSL v23 underscore method does in the first line of code? Not what it says. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Sort of. So SSL v23 is a, at the time, probably appropriately named, but now, sort of multiple years later, very inappropriately named function, which does version negotiation. So what it says is, I want to do the highest possible version of TLS that I can do, and the highest possible version that you can do, and we'll pick that and run with it. So if you both support TLS v1.2, that's what you should use. If you both support TLS 1.0, that's what you should use. But it's called SSL v23 method. Obvious. Um, at the time, it was probably sensible because uh, there was SSL v2 and SSL v3, and okay, we probably want to pick one of the two. Um, in fairness, there is a TLS underscore method now available, but that's only been, yeah, as far as a developer is concerned, late last year when Open SSL 1.1 came out. What Cypher Suite did we just negotiate? Whatever's on by default. Uh, OpenSSL's default, uh, at least prior to 1.1, is basically to use everything except for those which have null encryption algorithms. So in other words, basically all you're guaranteed is that your data isn't travelling over the wire in the clear. You, know, you might be using DES, you might be using RSA, uh, sorry, RC4, um, it may be completely insecure, but yeah, hey, it worked. You may or may not have perfect forward secrecy. It depends on the cipher suite. By perfect forward secrecy, we basically mean that if the secret key or the private key that the server has is compromised at some point in the future, the actual session traffic is still protected. So if we're using RSA, for example, as a key exchange, you, know, you do a session with your bank, exchange some details over the top of that. If the bank's private key is later compromised, I can then decrypt your session and basically find out what actually went on. Not so much a good thing. The certificate chain was, however, verified. Excellent. But if it failed, we just continued on anyway. <laughs> oh, and we also forgot to verify that the server name actually matched the certificate to what we thought we were connecting to. So we have another man in the middle vector. OK, we should really fix that. We need to make a call to SSL set verify to SSL verify peer. This means that if the verification process doesn't actually succeed, the handshake won't actually succeed and we'll know about it. Um, there is other ways that we could go about doing this. This is the, the most sensible. The default, as you may have guessed, is SSL verify none, i.e. Yeah, simply insecure by default. We also need to specify a file or a path which happens to contain the CA certificates, which we actually wish to use, which is Possibly a little obvious, or at least we could have a default. As far as the server name verification side of things goes, however, um, this is really fun. We need to know about X509. We need to know about common names. We need to know about subject alternative names. And you can go and read at least three RFCs that are, exist that document this stuff. There's only about 220 pages there. Once you've done, come back and we can talk about implementing it. And you, as a developer, basically are expected to do this yourself. There's a whole bunch of nastiness which can crop up. 
You know, things such as null characters embedded within names which exist within the subject alternative names. ASN.1 uses length prefix string, so it will tell you at the start of the string how many bytes it's going to be in it, and you know, we can deal with that many bytes. It doesn't matter if there's a couple of nulls hiding in the center of it. If we're using C, we're using null terminated strings which don't have length prefixes, we compare the two together, oh, yep, look, that matches perfectly. We have to figure out how to do things like wildcard matching. So, okay, well, if it starts with a star and ends with the thing which, you know, is in the specific, great. Well, mm, depends. Do you want to match star.com? Yeah, there's a whole bunch of gotchas around this stuff. You have to figure out how to correctly match IP addresses. You know, an IP address shouldn't actually be matched to a DNS name within a, a subject alternative name. We should only be matching IP general names. Do you do that correctly? It's about 200 lines of code to actually you know, implement this. At least since January 2015, there is in OpenSSL an X509 check host function, which does the bulk of this work for you. Excellent. But we still have to actually get the certificate and call this ourselves. So it's great if you remember to do it, but if you don't, well, you're in trouble. To talk a little bit about the design philosophy that went into libtls, basically it should be as easy to use as possible. Now, now, what's the exact definition of this? We have a situation where we're dealing with complex technology. You know, obviously I can't make this a one-line function which is going to do everything for you and you know, make the world a better place. There's going to be a little bit of effort involved on your part. but. You should do as little as possible, and it should be as easy as possible and as obvious as possible for you to do that. It should be safe and secure by default. It shouldn't be a case of, OK, yes, we can make it safe. Yes, we can make it secure. But in order to get there, I've got to jump through these 20,000 things and remember each one of them and do them correctly. This works some of the time. The rest of the time, well, we have security vulnerabilities and CVEs. It should be consistent, obvious, and well documented. The behavior, I heard a bit of a giggle there, probably related to the well-documented part. The behavior of the functions should do the same things. They shouldn't be a case of, well, this function can return 0, 1, which mean two different things, or we can invert them and return different values, or possibly negative 1 or negative 2, or you know, if it's a negative value, then do this or do something else. It should be, okay, if it returns this, it always has this result. And on top of this, we should support the use of things such as Pledge, CH Roots, and other sandbox environments. Um, if you're not familiar with OpenBSD, in the last couple of years, it's grown a thing called Pledge, which is basically a, a syscall restriction utility. A program, once it's done some work, can say, OK, from now on, I'm not going to make any calls which actually read or write to the file system. Um, I'll do network traffic with my existing sockets. That's it. So the sorts of things you can do you can say, OK, well, I'm going to load my private key. I'm going to do bits and pieces. And now I'm going to say, OK, from here on in, I'm not going to do anything else. So if we have a ex remote code exploit, that thing can't actually go, well, OK, now I want to read that file on disk. Um, there's a bunch of other things you know, in the Linux world. Seccomps are, are somewhat equivalent. But basically, all this means is that when we write code and when we write the library, we should ensure that access to files is deterministic. Either we should be accessing them at a well-known point or not at all. And if you create code which does this, you know, if it's not deterministic, halfway through the SSL handshake, well, hey, we need to go and read the CIOs off disk. You can't do these sorts of things. And it may also mean accepting configuration data via memory instead of using files. Um, one of the common cases here is when you write software which is privilege separated. We have multiple processes. We want to actually pass data over um, file descriptors instead of actually saying, hey, go and read this yourself. And we can do further isolation in that regard. So let's have a quick look at the libtls API. The man page has the rest of the details if you want them. But in summary, this is pretty much all you need to know. There's an init function. We have a configuration now object, for lack of a better description. You can create a new one of those. You can change it if you wish to do so. You then call TLS client or TLS server, depending on what you want to write. 
you call TLS configure and pass in the configuration object which you set up earlier. Once you've done that, you can call one of the several TLS connect functions or one of the several TLS accept functions. And basically the differences here are the amount of work that libtls will do for you or what it will accept as input. So for example, we have a set of functions which will take a single socket. You know, we have a set which will take a pair of file descriptors if, for example, you want to do SSL over TLS over pipes. And we have one which will provide callback functions so that you don't actually have to have it doing reading and writing over any form of file descriptor if you don't want to. There is an optional handshake function. Now, if you don't call handshake yourself, as soon as you call read or write and it hasn't been called, it will go and do that for you. It is there, however, because in certain cases you actually want to force a handshake, you want to make sure the handshake worked, you may then want to go and get additional data such as what certificate was actually presented before you actually go and you know, exchange data. But depending on your application, you may not need that. We'll do TLS reads and TLS writes, and once we're done with all that, we'll simply do a TLS close. So let's rewrite the code which I put up on the screen earlier. One thing to note is that we haven't actually established, uh, we haven't done the DNS to actually resolve www.linux.conf.au, we haven't actually established a connected socket. Yeah. All the code that you need is actually there. So again, we'll create a client, we'll cre uh, configure it. In this case, I don't want to change any of the default settings, so I'm simply saying configure it with null, which basically means we'll use the defaults. It, we'll do a TLS connect, we'll do a write, we'll do a read, and we'll do a close. What just happened? Well, you use TLS 1.2. End of story. You used an authenticated encryption with authenticated data or an AEAD cipher suite. Now, if you don't know what this is, it's basically a mode that you can use uh, with a cipher suite which effectively treats a, a cipher either as a stream, uh, treats a block cipher as a stream cipher in the case of things like GCM or you actually have a stream cipher in the case of things like ChaCha20. Um, there's a bunch of reasons why you want to do this, but in short, it's really hard to get it wrong. You know, we actually do the encryption, the Mac, you know, we can add data to it, we make sure everything checks out. You have perfect forward secrecy. Now, the cipher switch, which are enabled by default, are ones which actually provide this to you. The certificate chain was successfully verified. And no, we didn't continue on anyway if it happened to not work. And on top of all of this, the server name actually matched what you, yeah, you said you were going to connect to www.linux.conf.au. The certificate had to provide that in some form, either in a CN or a SAN, so that we actually allowed the connection to happen. So a little more about the API design that is used within libtls. As I mentioned earlier, things should be consistent and deterministic. If we fail, we return negative one or we return null. That's it. In the, we have a number of functions which um, basically return an integer value which purely indicates success or failure. And these always return negative one if they failed and zero effectively if they succeed. We have a number of other functions which I haven't mentioned there where you can pull out information. For example, you know, what protocol did we actually negotiate? What cipher suite did we use? These will return memory to you, but because we're returning what's effectively a character array, they will return null if something didn't work. So there's the two possible behaviors. It should be POSIX-like behavior where possible. Yes? Do you say so no? No. I'll come back to that one a little bit later. We intentionally clear it in a bunch of cases. If I don't come back to it, please ask me about it at the end. We don't sort of know, but we, yeah, and, and TLS read and TLS write are actually interesting because now they have what are effectively read and write like semantics to them. Now, if you know how to use read and write, you pretty much can drop in TLS read and TLS write, and yeah, you'll need to make a couple other minor changes, but it works pretty much as is. The reason this, this one's interesting, and I'll come back to some of this towards the end, but when I first implemented TLS read and TLS write, they didn't match read and write semantics. And it was actually various conversations with other developers, in particular a chap by the name of Bob Beck, who had convinced me that no, the right way to do this, even though read and write have their flaws, is to actually make them behave like read and write. 
And I yeah, argued with him for quite a long time over multiple coffees, and we ended up saying, yeah, okay, yeah, makes sense. And when you actually saw the changes to the programs which are actually making use of TLS read and TLS write, and the read and write versions above it to do clear text, the TLS read and TLS write versions you know, below it, it makes perfect sense. But it wasn't obvious at the time. We use opaque data structures, so things which are effectively allocated by the library, for example, when you call TLS config new, you don't actually know how much memory that thing actually uses, what the layout is, you can't poke around inside it. It means that we can actually change the way that the code works, we can increase or decrease the size of these structs, and your code keeps working. You know, we don't have ABI breakage as a result. Another rule which we use is that we take copies of strings and memories. We don't actually store pointers, and this means uh, that, if in effect, when you configure something and you say, hey, use this, you don't have to keep that memory around, you don't have to keep track of when the right time to free it is, or you know, end up leaking it. Also, we don't provide X509 or ASN1 as an interface to the library. There aren't any sharp edges. Some more general API design rules, which I would you know, certainly apply in this case, but I would encourage if you're actually working on an API to follow, keep it as simple as possible. And I talked about this earlier. Don't be afraid to iterate. One of the things which we did, and we certainly still do to some extent, is that we implement what we think is the correct version, but from time to time we'll go, yeah, that didn't quite work as well as it should have. Let's go back and change that. And there are certain situations where obviously you can't do this um, if you have significant API. PI breakage, it's going to cause downstream problems, but you either want ways that you can deal with that or you want your iteration to be short and fast so that this doesn't actually become a problem with other code bases. Another big one that I would encourage is only add features when there is actually demonstrated use of these. There's a couple of reasons for this. One is that it makes sure that the API that you're adding is absolutely appropriate. If you go and say, hey, we're going to implement this cool feature, let's add some code for it, now here's the API for it. What does that actually look like from the caller? Does it actually make sense? Does it work? It also means that you manage feature bloat. You don't add stuff which no one actually uses. Um, an example here is we had a, a request early on. We actually had some code come from someone saying, hey, look, we should add DTLS support to libtls. OK, that's great. What are you going to use this for? Um, well, yeah, a bunch of VPNs use it. So which open source VPN package are you planning on doing this with? Um, OK, come back to us when you actually have some code which uses it so we can make sure that it works, so that you're doing the right thing. This is you know, where, as a, a maintainer, you actually need to push back and think about what you're actually taking on board. And where possible, have symmetrical functions. Or, if, even better than this, have the same function. So in the case of some of them, which you'll see shortly when we're dealing with ALPN, if you can have the same function which both the client and server use, do that. Don't make two different functions. If it needs to be slight differences in behavior, so for example, TLS client and TLS server, then do that. Make them so that they're a pair. Moving along to some more API examples. So application layer protocol negotiation, or ALPN, is basically a protocol where we can say, hey, you know, I'm a client. I'm interested in or can support these app, uh, particular application layer protocols, might be one, might be two, and the server can basically do the same thing and we can work out what we're going to use as our preference when we're actually doing the TLS negotiation. Now, this originated as a thing called NPN, where Google's speedy protocol was effectively you know, being rolled out. What they would have had to have done if they didn't use something like this was basically deploy speedy on something other than port 443. And you know, that's not trivial amount of work. So there's basically ALPNs, the, the IETF ratified version. We can say, OK, hey, you know, I support HTTP 2 and I support HTTP 1.1. Take your pick. And the server will respond saying, use HTTP 2 or use HTTP 1.1. To do this in OpenSSL means that you have to set a callback. Um, before you can actually, well, you can set the callback, but when we actually are in the callback, we have to have already converted the ALPN protocols that we wish to use into wire format. This means that you have to write some code which takes whatever you have and packs it into length prefixed strings. 
Then we have to run our callback, which basically does something like what's there. Thankfully, they provided a function called SSL next proto or select next proto. And this will basically do the heavy work of working out what one end offered, what the other end offered in sense of a wire protocol and return uh, one of them to you. And we can do that. In libtls, we decided that we'd make this horrifically complex. That's all we have to do. We support HTTP 2, we support HTTP 1.1, take your pick. And this is equally valid both client and server. On the server side, we can simply find out, uh, sorry, on both sides, we can find out what was actually picked by a, a separate function. Um, but this is all you need to do as far as actually setting it up. Server name indication. So this is basically a feature where uh, most of you, if you've done anything with, with web hosting, you can run virtual servers. We can have multiple domains or, or sites listening on a single port 80 HTTP service, and it will work out what content to serve based on the host header. In the case of TLS, well, this is a little bit harder problem. We connect, we do the handshake, we have to figure out what certificate we're actually going to use in the handshake before we actually get to the point of doing HTTP, and we can figure out what site we should actually be serving based on the hostname header. All it is is a TLS extension, which when the client connects, it's during the handshake process, says, I want to connect to this particular server. Trivial. But if you want to implement this in the server-side case for libssl, I can't fit the code that you need to do that on that slide and probably on three or four slides. I wouldn't do that to you. Basically, as a high-level description, you need to, for each additional certificate that you want to use, you have to create an additional SSL context, you have to configure it, you have to load the certificate and the private key onto the new context, you then have to register a callback, which does fun things like receives the SNI, the, the value that the client passed, that's easy enough, but then you've got to manually determine which of those certificates and hence which of those SSL contexts you actually need to use. Now, this either means that you have to do things like going through all of the CNs, all the subject alt names and building up some sort of hash, or you have to walk through them at the time that the callback is actually triggered. And then we finally have to switch manually the SSL context in for the connection. And now say, okay, well, now they said that they wanted to use this particular server, let's use that particular server. Again, for libtls, you can expect we've got a chunk of code to do this. For each additional certificate that you wish to add, you have to do that. <laughs> what this does behind the scenes is all the stuff which I just described before. When the client says, okay, I want this particular SNI, this server name, it sends a particular server name indication, the negotiation happens, you writing some server code can simply call that and then go, which one did it use? It's easy. It's obvious. With SNI, going back to what I was saying before about actually creating use cases for your code before you actually write the code or write the interface to it, I'll talk a little bit later on, but there's a HTTP server which was implemented for within OpenBSD, and I wrote the, the TLS, or the HTTPS implementation using TLS, which has you know, been part of the proving ground that we've had. A big, I'll say a letdown, was I spent quite a chunk of time adding server-side support to libtls, involved a whole heap of refactoring. The diff to add support to HTTPD pretty much looked like that. It was two or three lines. It's like, what? After all that? But, yeah, it worked. I want to have a quick look at return codes and error handling because this is something which I sort of skipped over and I sort of cheated a little bit with the examples that I gave earlier on because some of this stuff I didn't actually do. Yeah, who noticed? No one? Okay. Oh, should have mentioned it. In libssl, if one of the functions um, that follows returns less than or equal to zero, you have to call a thing called SSL get error in order to actually, and you have to pass in the value that you got earlier on in order to actually figure out what happened and what the next step you should take. 
So if it's SSL connect except read or write or shut down, then we've got to do something like the following. <coughs> you have to get the error. You have to work out whether it's error none or error zero return. Now, these are valid things. It might have been a want read, want write, want connect, or want accept, and these indicate that we're trying to do something that was actually an underlying process or, or step which actually needs to happen. In the case of TLS, because of the fact that we've got handshakes and things going on, we've got situations where we have to you know, wait for data to become available before we can actually do a write. We've actually got to call it the handshake process. But the fun ones are things like this one here, where we have a case where, OK, uh, it's returned SSL error syscall. We might be able to get an error off the error stack, but if it doesn't exist, well, if it's, you know, we might be able to check Erno and actually get some sort of value back, and we could do something with that. Not my idea of fun. LibTLS. We have something which basically uh, mentioned earlier, things return neg1 on error. You can call TLS config error or TLS error to work out what went wrong. We do have a couple of extra special return values. We have a TLS want poll in and want poll out for handshake, read, write, and close. Because if, for example, we're using non-blocking sockets, we need to know, OK, what's the next thing which we, what's the next event which we actually need to be able to progress this further? Do we need data to be available? Do we need to be able to write to the socket? So what's wrong with a bad API? Yeah, it was this way when I found it. They lead to security vulnerabilities, memory leaks, bugs, wasted time, developer frustration. You know, I'm sure all of you who have messed around trying to write open SSL based or libssl based software have been tearing your hair out at various points trying to figure out what's going on. Um, there's an excellent paper from 2012 which was done by uh, some researchers at Stanford and I think the University of Austin, Texas. It was titled The Most Dangerous Code in the World, Validating SSL Certificates in Non-Browser Software. And they basically went through and pulled apart a whole bunch of libraries. They looked at them and went, OK, this is dangerous. Why is it dangerous? And the, it's, they gave a bunch of recommendations, but this, the conclusion that they arrived at was that a principled solution of the problem must involve a complete redesign of SSL libraries API. It's an API problem. People can't figure out how to use it. Likewise with Python, um, PEP 476, which was from 2014, uh, sorry, was enabling certificate verification by default for ST, uh, standard libhttp clients. And they noted in this that the failure of various applications to note Python's negligence in this matter is a regular source of CVE assignment. Now that particular PEP cites 11 CVEs which exist in not Python but various applications which were developed using Python all of them due to bad default behavior. We can do better than this. Yeah? Python, to their credit, fixed it. They went and changed the default. Just for some uh, final amusement, um, there's some examples of how not to do things. There's a function in libssl called SSL cipher description. You pass it in a cipher, which you know, is a struct, has some, some state to it, and it returns you a description. This can return a pointed to dynamically allocated character array, which you as a caller are then required to free. Or it can return a pointer to a static string. Calling free on a static string, yeah, not so much. We can't really tell the difference between the two. So what do we do? We have to use strucomp. So you write code which looks like the following. Did we get back a description of OpenSSL underscore malloc error, in which case we can't free this thing, or otherwise, yeah, it was okay, it worked, we can go for it. <laughs> Some lessons to learn from this one. Only return dynamic memory or static memory. Don't mix the two. If you're going to write something which says, okay, you, know, you as the caller are responsible to free this, don't return stuff which I can't free. Or better yet, return a signal of success or failure and then pass the data back by reference. And again, please make that one type. Another example, which uh, this is one which isn't strictly libssl, this is more libcrypto, but we've been rubbing our or banging our heads against it recently, so it was sort of top of mind. It's a thing called x509 verify cert that libssl calls in order to work out whether the cert that you've been provided actually verifies. You know, one of the ones, things we were talking about earlier. It returns one if the chain built and successfully validated. It returns less than or equal to zero if something failed. But wait, there's more. 
free state of state nodes. No, not quite. Um, we can call a thing called x509 store context get error to get an internal error code which will actually tell you potentially whether the thing was x509 okay. It may indicate there was an internal error. We didn't have uh, memory available. We indicated some sort of verification failure, or i.e., for example, if it had an unknown issuer. But we can return success one, and we can have an internal error code which isn't actually set to x509 VOK. Or we could previously have a return value of zero which indicated failure, and we could have an internal error code which was x509 VOK. How do you handle this as an application developer? <laughs> Um, please, if you're going to indicate multiple, in multiple places success and failure, make sure you keep them in sync. And better yet, have a function which signals whether the thing worked or didn't, whether we had an internal failure, and then give the one source as being the authoritative source. Just quickly, OpenBSD is our development playground, and I need to you know, acknowledge this. One of the reasons that LibTLS and you know, LibS, uh, LibSSL in general have been from my perspective, successful is that it's a proving ground. When I first did Libri SSL, which became LibTLS, the first thing which got changed was our FTP client, which is effectively a fetch tool. Uh, HTTPD, which got written later on, uh, a funny story there, we actually managed to get one of our developers drunk at the hackathon and basically dared him that he couldn't write a HTTP daemon. Um, we had one the next day. <laughs> but we have one client and one server, so we've got, again, this thing where we can actually test what's going on. We also now have things like Acme Client, which is a Let's Encrypt client, things like Netcat, NTPD, SpamD, SyslogD. And the other big one I need to acknowledge is the ports tree which we have, which is you know, around about 9,000 odd packages, which are open source software, which is pulled down and compiled and tested on OpenBSD. These guys work tirelessly to make sure that things work, and when we break stuff, they let us know, or they you know, go out of the way. One particular guy, Stuart Henderson, who runs things like diffs across a massive amount of open source source code for me to find out whether this one particular thing is used or not um, and compiles things. So in summary, if you're going to create APIs that are part of a project, please make sure that they're intuitive, easy to use and safe by default. Don't make your users jump through hoops in order to turn on things, in order to actually make things sane and default. They should be that way. Develop code which actually uses the API before or during the API development process. Don't go writing an API and then go, oh look, here it is. Doesn't usually work. Well, at least it doesn't work in the best way possible. And also think about the corner cases that you have and consider what the users might overlook. What's the weird thing that someone's going to do with this? Thank you. Right, I think we have time for just one question. I saw a hand up back there, so. I, I, just, I just wanted to make the point that don't just think about the weird corner cases that users might overlook, write a test case for that weird corner case that somebody might overlook. Absolutely. Well, that wasn't a question, but uh, can we get, I think we do actually still have time for a real question, so I think there was one. Uh, what does LibTLS do um, by default with OCSP stapling and what does it support uh, in the client and the server and uh, does it grok the TLS feature extension formerly known as OCSP no staple? So the answer them in reverse, the no staple one I can't answer off the top of my head, I can look and we can talk about that later. OCSP, it does both client and server. So from a client's perspective, we basically, if the server responds with an OCSP stapling, it will validate that and make sure it's okay and the handshake by default won't actually succeed if it doesn't. From the server side, we don't, it, it's basically implemented in the form of a blob. So you tell us what you want us to send the client and we'll send it to them. So we intentionally haven't implemented OCSP as, as, in as far as we're actually gonna go and fetch the blob from the, from the responder so that we can actually serve it up. But if you do that out of band and you tell us, hey, this thing needs to go to the client, we'll do that for you. So it's both given you know, a relative level of complexity, but at the same time, we can achieve things without writing a, a whole heap of code. Thanks. Uh, thank you for coming, everyone. I um, hope you all had a good talk. I had enjoyed the talk. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Next.